Hey y'all, how you doing today? I today am having having some heartburn. I mean, I, I I get it from time to time, and most likely why I get it is because of how I eat. I eat a lot of the uh, the fatty acids, a lot of the sugars, a lot of things like that, and so I'm sure that's part of what what causes some of this uh, acid indigestion or heartburn or whatever it is and I usually use like uh, peppermint and uh, cinnamon um, I use uh, usually a base of vitamin C little things like that to help keep it under control anyway I don't know maybe you guys have some other suggestions <laughs> besides I know the obvious change your diet I've done that from time to time. But anyway, if you guys have any suggestions, go ahead and leave them in the comments down below. And today we've got the Borrowers Afloat. Wow. And we're getting on with the book a little over halfway. We're on chapter 13, but remember, we've got two more books after this. We have the Borrowers Aloft, and we have the Borrowers Avenged. Let's go ahead here and see if you guys get your copy of the book. Like, share, and subscribe. Let's jump into chapter 14. Although she seemed nearly aground, a runnel of ice-cold water ran between the boat and the shore. Through this they waded, and Spiller at the prow helped them to climb aboard roomy but clumsy but with her flat bottom practically impossible to capsize she was in fact as homily had guessed a knife box very long and narrow with symmetrical compartments for varying sizes of cutlery more what you'd call a barge remarked pod looking about him a wooden handle rose up inside to which he noticed the legging had been nailed. Holds her firm, explained Spiller, tapping the roof of the canopy. Say you want to lift up the sides. The holds were empty at the moment, except for the narrowest. In this, Pod saw an amber-colored knitting needle that ran the length of the vessel. A folded square of frayed red blanket. A wafer-thin butter knife of tarnished Georgian silver and the handle and blade of his old nail scissor. So you've still got that, he said. Comes in useful, said Spiller. Careful, he said as Pod took it up. I've sharpened it up a bit. Wouldn't mind this back, said Pod a trifle endlessly. Say one day you got another like it. Not so easy to come by, said Spiller, as though to change the subject. He took up the butter knife. Found this wedged down on a crack on the side. Does me all right for a paddle. Just the thing, said Pod. All the cracks and joints were filled in now, he noticed, as regretfully as he put back the nail scissor. Where did you pick up this knife box in the first place? Lying on the bottom, upstream, full of mud when I spotted her. Bit of a job to salvage. Up by the caravans, that's where she was. Like as not, someone pinched the silver and didn't want the box. Like as not, said Pod. So you sharpened her up? He went on, staring again at the nail scissor. That's right, said Spiller, and stood swiftly. He snatched up the piece of blanket. You take this, he said. Might be chilly in the kettle. What about you? That's all right, said Spiller. You take it. Oh, exclaimed Homily. It's the bit we had in the boot. And then she colored slightly. I think, she added. That's right, said Spiller. Better you take it. Well, thanks, said Pod, and threw it over his shoulder. He looked around again. The legging, he realized, was both camouflage and shelter. You done a good job, Spiller. I mean, 
You could live in a boat like this. Come wind, say, and wet weather. That's right, agreed Spiller. And he began to ease the knitting needle out from under the legging. The knob emerging forward at an angle. Don't want to hurry you, he said. Homely seemed taken aback. You going already? She faltered. Sooner he's gone, sooner he's back, said Pod. Come on, Homley. All ashore now. But how long does he reckon he'll be? What would you put it at? Spiller asked Pod. A couple of days? Three? Four? A week? Maybe less, maybe more, said Spiller. Depends on the weather. Three now nights from now, if it's moonlight. But what if we're asleep in the kettle? said Homily. That's all right, Homily. Spiller will knock. Pod took her firmly by the elbow. Come on now, all ashore. You too, Arietti. As Homily, with Pod's help, was lowered into the water, Arietti jumped from the side. The wet mud, she noticed, was spangled all over with tiny footprints. They linked arms and stood well back to watch Spiller depart. He unloosened the painter and paddle in his hand, let the boat slide stern foremost from under the brambles. As it glided out into open water, it became unnoticeable suddenly and somehow part of the landscape. It might have been a curl of bark or a piece of floating wood. It was only when Spiller laid down the paddle and stood up to punt the needle that he became all conspicuous. They watched through the brambles as slowly and painstakingly leaning at each plunge on his pole, he began to come back upstream. As he came abreast of them, they ran out from the brambles to see better. Shoes in hand, they crossed the beach of the kettle and, to keep up with him, climbed round the bluff at the corner and onto the beach of the drain. There, by the tree root, which came sharply into deepish water, they waved him the last goodbye. I wish he hadn't had to go, said Homily, as they made their way back across the sand toward the mouth of the drain. There lay their clothes, drying in the sun, and as they approached, an iridescent cloud, like a flock of birds, flew off the top of the egg. Blue bottles, cried Homily, running forward. Then relieved, she slackened her steps. They were not blue bottles, after all, but cleanly burnished river flies, striped gaily with blue and gold. The egg appeared untouched. But Homily blew on it hard and dusted up with her apron, because, she exclaimed, you never know where they may have put their feet. Pod poking about among the flotsam and jetsam salvaged the circular cork that Homily had used as a seat. This'll just about do it, he murmured reflectively. Do what? asked Arietti idly. A beetle had run out from where the cork had been resting and stopping. She held it by its shell. She liked beetles, their shiny, clear-cut armor, their mechanical joints and joins, and she liked just a little to tease them. They were so easy to hold by the sharp edge of their wing casing and so anxious to get away. One day you'll get bitten, Homily warned her as she folded up her clothes, which still, though dry, smelled faintly and pleasantly of sandalwood, or stung, or nipped, or whatever they do. And serve you right. Arietti let the beetle go. They don't mind, really, she remarked, watching the horned legs scuttle up the slope and the fine gains of dislodged sand tumble down behind them. And here's an air pin, exclaimed Pod. It was the one Arietti had found in the drain. Clean, washed now and gleaming. You know what we should do, he went on. While we're here, that is. What? asked Homily. Come along here regular like every morning and see what the drains brought down. There wouldn't be anything I'd fancy, said Homily, finding the last grommet. 
What about a gold ring? Many a gold ring, or so I've heard, gets lost down a drain. And you wouldn't say no to a safety pin. I'd sooner a safety pin, said Homley, living as we do now. They carried the bundles round the bluff onto the beach by the kettle. Homley climbed up the smooth stone and wedged the kettle at an angle and peered in through the rust hole. A cold light shone down from above where the lid was raised by its string. The interior smelled of rust and looked very uninviting. What we want now, before sundown, said Pod, is some good, clean, dried grass to sleep on. We've got the piece of blanket. He looked about for some way of climbing the bank. There was a perfect place, as though invented for borrowers, where a cluster of tangled roots hung down from the lip of the cliff that curved deeply behind them. At some time, the stream had risen and washed the roots clean of earth, and they hung in fetstoons and clusters, ecstatic, but safely anchored. Pod and Arietti went up, hand over hand. There were handholds and footholds, seats, swings, ladders, ropes. It was a borrower's gymnasium and almost a disappointment to Arietti when so soon they reached the top. Here, among the jade-like spears of new spring growth, were pale clumps of hair-like grasses bleached to the color of tau. Pod reaped these down. With his razor blade, and Arietti tied them into sheaves. Humley, below, collected these bundles as they pushed them over the cliff edge and carried them up to the kettle. When the floor of the kettle was well and truly lined, Pod and Arietti climbed down. Arietti peered in through the rust hole. The kettle now smelled of hay. The sun was sinking, and the air felt slightly colder. What we all need now, remarked Homily, is a good hot drink before bed. But there was no means of making one. So they got out the egg instead. There was plenty left. They each had a thickish slice, topped off by a leaf of sorrel. Pod unpacked his length of tarred string, knotted one end securely and passed the other through the center of the cork. He pulled it tight. "'What's that for?' asked Homley, coming beside him, wiping her hands on her apron. "'Can't you guess?' asked Pod. He was trimming the cork now, breathing hard and beveling the edges. "'To block up the rust hole?' "'That's right,' said Pod. "'We can pull it tight like some kind of stopper, once we're all safely inside. Arietti had climbed up the roots again. They could see her on top of the bank. It was breezier up there, and her air was stirring slightly in the wind. Around her, the great grass blades in gentle motion crossed and recrossed against the darkened sky. She likes it out of doors, said Homley fondly. What about you? asked Pod. Well said Homily after a moment. I'm not one for insects. Pod never was, nor for the simple life, if there is such a thing. But tonight, she gazed about her at the peaceful scene. Tonight, I feel kind of all right. That's the way to talk, said Pod, scraping away with his razor blade. Or it might, said Homily, watching him, be partly due to that cork. An owl hooted somewhere in the distance, on a hollow, wobbling note. A liquid note, it seemed, failing musically on the dusk. But Homley's eyes widened. Arietti? She called shrilly. Quick! Come on down! They felt snug enough in the cuddle, kettle, snug and secure, with a cork pulled in and the lid let down. Homley had insisted on the latter precaution. We won't need to see, she explained to Pod and Arietti, and we get enough air down the spout. When they woke up in the morning, the sun was up and the kettle felt rather hot. But it was exciting to lift off the lid, hand over hand on the twine, and see the cloudless sky. Pod kicked out the cork, and they crawled through the rust hole, and there again was the beach. 
They breakfasted out of doors. The egg was wearing down, but there was two-thirds left to go. And the shine feeds, said Pod after breakfast. Pod went off with his hat pin to see what had come down the drain. Homely busied herself about the kettle and laid out the blanket to air. Arietti climbed the roots again to explore the top of the bank. Keep within earshot, Pod had warned them, and call out now and again. We don't want accidents at this stage, not before Spiller arrives. And we don't want them then, retorted Homely, but she seemed curiously relaxed. There was nothing to do but wait. No housework, no cooking, no borrowing, no planning. Might as well enjoy ourselves, she reflected and settled herself in the sun on a piece of red blanket. To Pod and Arietti, she seemed to be dozing, but this was not the case at all. Homely was busy daydreaming about a house with a front door and windows, a home of their very own. Sometimes it was small and compact. Sometimes four stories high. And what about the castle? She wondered. For some reason, the thought of the castle reminded her of Lupi. And what would they be thinking now, back there in that shuttered house? That we vanished into thin air? That's what it will seem to them. Humbly imagined Lupi's surprise, the excitement, the conjectures. And smiling to herself, she half closed her eyes. Never would they think of the drain. And never in their wildest dreams would they think of little Fordham. Two Halklin days went by, but on the third day it rained. Clouds gathered in the morning, and by afternoon there was a downpour. At first, Airy Eddie, avid to stay outdoors, took shelter among the roots under the overhanging bank. But soon the rain drove them in on the wind and leaked down from the bank above. The roots became slippery and greasy with mud, so all three of them fled to the drain. I mean, said Homily as they crouched in the entrance, at least from where we can see out, which is more than you can say for the kettle. They moved from the drain, however, when Pod heard a drumming in the distance. Holmcroft, he exclaimed, after listening a moment, come on, get moving. Homely staring at the gray veil of rain outside protested that if they were in for a soaking, they might as well just have it hot as cold. It's kind of funny to kind of see what's going on and, and what life would be like if you were six inches tall. Hmm. What kind of things would you guys do if you were that height? What places would you go? How would you live? All interesting wilds that Mary Norton has kind of put a pen to. What do you guys think? Maybe give me a short little story down below of what you think you would do if six inches tall you were. Anyway, I want to say thank you guys so, so very much for tuning in today. And you have a wonderful and blessed day.